Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Bart. I have the privilege today of leading a discussion on the social capital markets and impact investment with a very distinguished panel. If I can ask for your uh, kindness, I'll spend a few minutes at initially setting the stage, going through a handful of slides on how I see the impact investment market developing uh, over the next few years. I'll mention briefly the work we're doing in Impact Investment Exchange Asia, and then I'll turn to our pan panelists to get their inputs on the social capital markets and impact investment. So, since we're discussing impact investment, I, I think it's good to first spend a little time getting clear about our terminology. What is impact investing? Um, first, to be clear, we're talking about investing capital, making investments, not donations, not grants, uh, but investments, whether they're loans, equity investments, into businesses and funds that are designed with the intent to generate positive social or economic or social environmental impact. So into the types of social enterprises that we've been hearing about this morning and in yesterday's session. Important to note, however, that since we're talking about investment, investors expect in addition to creating social impact, in, in addition to creating environmental impact, to also generate a financial return. And so that's important to realize, to set the stage about what we're talking about. So how big is the potential market for impact investing? Uh, the Monitor Institute has estimated that impact investing can grow to be a 500 billion US dollar market in the near term. Now that's, that's a huge amount of capital by any measure, but just to put it in perspective uh, in this chart, I compare it to philanthropy on the one hand, and you can see that if we are able to reach $500 billion market for impact investment, this will actually be larger than the entire uh, annual amount of philanthropic giving. And I think it shows that impact investing can be a, a very important supplement, not a replacement for philanthropy, but a very important supplement to philanthropy. At the same time, it's important to see that $500 billion larger than it, as it is, is a very, very small sliver of the traditional capital markets. And it shows that we, we only need to catalyze a very small amount of those investment dollars uh, to support social initiatives to make an enormous difference. Now, but is this achievable? Is there really sufficient demand from social enterprises for that much capital? And is there really a sufficient supply of capital from investors who care about supporting social and, and environmental goals? I, I naturally think there is, and I'm here to tell you why. Um, first, if we look at the demand side, uh, I have some figures here from a, a pioneering study uh, released just a few months ago by J.P. Morgan and the Rockefeller Foundation that tried to size the, the demand for investment from just five sectors. Uh, and you can see here microfinance, affordable urban housing, uh, clean water, maternal health. Uh, together, just these five sectors, they estimated, could use anywhere between 400 billion and nearly a trillion dollars of capital over the next year, uh, next 10 years. Factor in clean technology, sustainable agriculture, education, healthcare, and this can easily, uh, the 500 billion dollar figure can easily be obtained. What about the supply of capital? Are there really investors out there who want to make investments that support social and environmental causes? I, I think here, this is actually, I think, the easier side. I think there are many investors who, given the opportunity, would like to do exactly that. And I put just one data point up here. This is from a, a study that focused on US individual investors last year. And it found that just in that market, there's over $120 billion of capital that people would like to invest in these markets. So if you factor in European individuals, Asian individuals, and you factor in institutions, and I think, again, you can easily see how we can get to that $500 billion potential market. Yeah. So if there's a growing group of social enterprises out there who need capital, and there's a growing group of investors who want to put that capital to work to support their social missions, what's stopping that from happening? What's keeping them from connecting? And I think the answer, quite simply, is that this market needs some time to develop and mature. Uh, as it happened today, uh, and it needs to continue to happen. So we need to see in 
industry associations forming to playing a leadership role. Associations like the GIN, the Global Impact Investing Network, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, just playing a leadership role here. We need to see more research and more advocacy highlighting the investment opportunities. We need to see the development of more and more intermediaries who can bring social enterprises together with the investors who are looking to make investments. And we need to see the development of more infrastructure to make that happen smoothly. So we need to see the development of rating standards like the IRIS and the GEAR systems and like the HIP scorecard that Paul can talk about a little later to develop. And we need to see marketplaces like those who are developing an impact investment exchange Asia come into place to help that process of investment into social enterprises be more efficient. So that, that brings me to what we're doing at Impact Investment Exchange, and I'll just say a few words about that. At Impact Investment Exchange, we are creating platforms to bring social enterprises and impact investors together more efficiently to help improve the capital raising process for social enterprises. Our mission is really to help social enterprises access capital to fund their growth, while at the same time allowing impact investors to better source and more easily find the investments that they want to make. Um, our goal, our ultimate goal, is to help channel capital into social enterprises from all across the developing markets here in Asia Pacific. Uh, to fulfill our mission, we are creating two platforms. The first of these we call impact partners, is focused on improving the market for private investments into Asian social enterprises. It will be a private marketplace to connect social venture capital funds and individual investors with a social mandate with pre-screened Asian social enterprises seeking private venture funding. Uh, the aim is to improve the efficiency of the capital raising process um, and to attract more investment into Asian social the, the second platform is Impact Exchange, will be Asia's first social stock exchange. And that will provide an even higher degree of transparency and liquidity as it helps investors make not only investments, but then to trade investments in social enterprises. Impact Partners, the first platform, is scheduled to launch later this month. Um, and we'll look to raise funding for enterprises that are not startups, but still in early growth phase, who may be looking for $250,000 or more of capital. The Impact Exchange is planned to launch early next year, and we'll look to raise capital for more mature social enterprises that may be looking for $5 million or more of capital. So, I've spoken enough. Thank you. So let me now introduce our distinguished panel, uh, and we can hear their views on the capital markets and how they can support uh, social entrepreneurship and, and sustainable development throughout Asia. So let me transition over here. And on my immediate left, let me introduce Robert Van Sweeten. Robert is the Director for the Private Sector Capital Markets and Financial Sector Department uh, at the Asian Development Bank. And in that role, he uh, leads ADB's efforts in, in those sectors. Um, he has, has also had a long, distinguished career in private uh, financial institutions, which he brings to bear in that role. To his left, Ashwin Dayal is the Managing Director of Asia for the Rockefeller Foundation, based here in Bangkok. Uh, he leads all of Rockefeller Foundation's uh, efforts here, here in Asia Pacific. And then to his left, uh, Mr. Paul Herman, who I believe you have all met before, the, the founder and CEO of HIP Investor. Um, so without further ado, let me address the first question to, to you, Robert. Um, you, you bring a unique perspective to this, and having both uh, been involved in capital markets development from the public sector, as well as having been a senior executive at one of the major stock exchanges in the region. What role do you see capital markets uh, can play in contributing to sustainable development in the Asia Pacific region? Uh, thanks, Rob, and uh, thank you very much for having me on this panel. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you can tell we're talking about capital and capital raising because immediately the gender balance on the panel is slightly impaired. And we're suddenly also wearing suits. Uh, funny how that happens. Um, 
the uh, issue around sustainable development uh, is a very acute one. Uh, and I think the discussion about tension between sustainable development and economically inclusive development at ADB and at other multilateral development banks has only just started. Why is there tension? Um, when we think about economically inclusive development as measured by GDP, we all hope that the uh, GDP per capita goes up in our developing member countries. And so people tend to start riding motorbikes and driving cars and buying fridges and flying airplanes to vacation destinations. But clearly, when we think about sustainable development, uh, that is something that uh, will not endure. If we look at the, uh, the climate change science, uh, there's a big public debate in the United States about this, but uh, I think it does stand well the scientists to agree on the numbers. Uh, there's actually a very acute challenge. We need to improve our way of life about 20-fold in terms of uh, CO2 grams per dollar of GDP created. So if we're going to be reconciling inclusive developments and sustainable development, Essentially, we need to re-engineer our way of life. And, um, of course, this is where social enterprise comes in. When we think about social enterprise, we think about um, enterprise striving, of course, for both financial and social returns in areas like microfinance, education, uh, health healthcare, um, clean energy, uh, renewable energy. Uh, by the way, these are all focus areas as well for Asian development bank, so we're very close to, to all of these, uh, these areas. Um, this is really what, what would need to be mainstream, and this is where the capital markets uh, should be playing uh, a very big role. Um, I'll come back to that uh, in a minute, in just a little bit more uh, detail. Let me just briefly talk about why we think uh, the idea of uh, the impact investing exchange has come come uh, to Asia. Uh, of course, uh, there, there are some uh, types of uh, social exchanges elsewhere, but this would be the first of its kind in Asia, and uh, we think uh, it could come at a, at a better time. When we think about uh, some of the issues that we need to highlight as one goes through the process of setting up an exchange like this, um, and this is absolutely vital from our perspective in terms of raising capital successfully. First of all, there needs to be a very good appearance of corporate governance. Now, usually when we talk about corporate governance, people start yawning. But it's good to remember that the failure in corporate governance was the single biggest driver behind the global economic crisis. And so the social enterprise sector cannot fall in the trap that the conventional enterprise sector has fallen into, which is to fail on that score. The second, of course, is that we would need transparent reporting of returns, of financial and social returns. Uh, we need to have credible operating track records and financial performance. Um, and in terms of an exchange setting, of course, it comes about by uh, pre-listing due diligence. Before social enterprise is listed, due diligence needs to be done, and certain listing requirements needs to be complied with. And finally, we need a, a well-regulated marketplace with ongoing monitoring and surveillance uh, of the listed social enterprises. Now, this, you will say, uh, all sound uh, familiar, critical success factors. In fact, yes. Uh, when we look at the convention capital markets, uh, these are just as much critical success factors as when we talk about a, an exchange or uh, capital markets in the marketplace uh, for social enterprise. Um, and, uh, I think that is basically a, a truth uh, that is self-evident, but the execution, of course, is a lot harder. We've seen it over the last few years. And then finally, I guess it's a specific exchange uh, requirement. Um, exchange also can only operate credibly when they've got a very well-functioning uh, information technology backbone uh, that uh, allows for uh, quick execution, whether it be for, for bonds or let me just circle that a little bit uh, back to uh, capital raising for, for social enterprise. Um, we, we see Rob's slide up 
which they, the, the need for about $500 billion of capital for, for the, the, so the larger universe of social enterprises. Um, I would think, I've never seen numbers on this, but I, think, I would think that the majority of social enterprises, as we now know, are actually simply being funded by uh, friends and family. Uh, the relatively small social enterprise uh, that gets backed, funded by parties relatively close to, to the founder. Um, then when you get a little bit bigger, perhaps more successful, uh, more visible NGOs or foundations become this that don't fund this. Uh, and I guess when you really become visible and have a successful track record, uh, then others come into that. Maybe bilateral development banks or multilateral development banks. Maybe some socially motivated uh, private equity might take an interest in you. Uh, and perhaps even uh, some socially motivated high net worth individuals uh, with their family offices or their foundation. Now, this is all good and well, but this is not where, in the grand scheme of things, the big capital is. Um, when we look, again, I refer back to Rob's slide, when we look at uh, the total pot of private sector institution capital, we talk about $53 trillion. It's a difficult number to get one's arms around, but most of it. It's concentrated in uh, the pension funds, about $13 trillion. Uh, the insurance companies, uh, I think the latest number is about uh, $4 million, uh, four, sorry, four trillion dollars. Then we have uh, the mutual funds sitting at $9 trillion, and that's just not that true. Sub and wealth funds, uh, about uh, $3.5 to $4 trillion, that's just not that true. This is where the large private sector institutional capital is. These are the sources that need to be mobilized. And the only way to do that is to make sure that it's mainstreamed, you get mainstreamed through a conduit uh, like, like an exchange, a marketplace that is transparent, fair, uh, well-regulated, and, and functions and delivers. Uh, and so that's why uh, at AUB we think that the time for IAX is truly gone. Thank you. Leave it at Thank you, Robert. Now I'd like to turn to Ashwin. Ashwin, you lead the Rockefeller Foundation's efforts here in Asia. And the Rockefeller Foundation, for those of you who don't know, is one of the world's, has been and continues to be one of the world's uh, leaders in providing philanthropic grant funding uh, to uh, nonprofit organizations. Why, why does a major philanthropic donor like the Rockefeller Foundation uh, feel that supporting impact investment is an important? Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me the opportunity to, to speak here today. Um, you, you sort of answered that question, Robert, by the numbers you put up. Um, you know, I, I, I know I'm wearing a suit, but, um, but I'm probably the one who's, who stands out as being the one who knows the least about the financial markets around banking, around how investors actually work. I've spent 20 years working in the field of development, actually, essentially, in a grant led model. Um, of trying to bring about positive change. And I think that's an incredibly important sector uh, that actually provides a very critical bridge in terms of financing uh, to the larger effort and the larger challenge that we have in front of us. Uh, but at the end of the day, the numbers you presented are precisely the reason why an organization like the Rockefeller Foundation that's been in existence for almost 100 years is thinking about the creation of new markets and the way in which new types of markets need to emerge to drive much larger scale change. You know, the, the number on the financial that you put up there, about 300 billion, if you break that down and look at how much of that is actually going for what we would call traditional development in developing economies, which is our interest, um, that's probably only, that's probably about under 100 billion, um, maybe 70, 75. And in the vagaries of the current economic climate in many of the Western traditional donor economies, uh, that number could actually fall in the coming we don't really know what way traditional aid is going to go in. At the same time, as we've been trying to tackle the, all of the different challenges and problems that we recognize as traditional development challenges, whether it's health, education, increasing economic opportunities, whatever those might be, even responding to disasters, um, we've started to learn over the last 15, 20 years about where market-based and market-driven solutions can actually be far more effective as a complement to what others are doing in terms of scaling up and in terms of actually creating sustainable solutions. 
So it's not just that there's an investor community out there that can be tapped, it's also a recognition within the development community that markets as a way of solving basic development challenges need to be nurtured and need to be supported. And for markets to expand, therefore, you need larger flows of capital, you need a larger investor base to be directing money towards the right kinds of businesses. And I think we should be having a very robust debate about what those right kinds of businesses are. Um, and I think that's where this goal around trying to create the right ecosystem and the right infrastructure to support the impact investment industry was, that was our starting point as a foundation. So the, the Rockefeller Foundation about four years ago, 2008 or thereabouts, launched an initiative that we call the Impact Invest, Harnessing the Power of Impact Investing, where we decided to dedicate a, a portion of our grant money, subsidies if you like, to actually invest in this early stage of building a field. But that is a field that is essentially market driven. And I think we should be careful not to not to write off the importance of subsidy in this process. And, and you know, grant making is an important complement to trying to build a, a new field. It's happened in many other industries over the decades, uh, and it will be the same for this industry as well. There's a reason why the Rockefeller Foundation and the Asian Development Bank are sitting up here having this conversation with you. It does require patient capital or grant capital in order to build a field, even when you're talking about markets. Um, but we also need to de develop credible instruments for measurement, credible instruments for impact, so that, as I said earlier, we actually believe that what we're investing in is linked to the kind of development goals that we all aspire to. In 2015, we're going to reach the, the, the threshold year for the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. There's going to be some places that are going to achieve those goals. A lot of places are falling behind. And I think it's a really interesting opportunity to reflect on, as this industry grows, how is, it going to how is it going to benchmark its performance with relation to, in relation to those basic development goals? And that's another area that we've been very interested in why we've been involved in looking at supporting things like the measurement systems, the impact reporting system, gears, etc., etc. But I think more work actually has to be done in that regard. So the foundation through its program has been essentially working at three levels, again, which, which you sort of touched on in your presentation, supporting venues for collective action getting forums of investors together. The Global Impact Investing Network, which we were a founder of, is one such effort. There are others. But creating more platforms to, for investors to come together, to understand what the opportunity is, and to have, to, to, to be frank, a safe space to actually have the dialogue about what entering this sort of brave new world, if you like, is really going to look like. The intermediation um, and the infrastructure creation. Impact Investment Exchange is a great example of that there's the rating systems, there's a whole lot of ecosystem building, if you like, that has to happen in order to reduce, effectively to reduce the transaction costs and increase the ease of access for a mainstream investor to come into this space. So it is not just the patient capital, but eventually the mainstream capital that is, a, that is able to easily distinguish uh, what it's entering into as this asset class of impact investing that we're talking about. The last few points I want to make that I think we're keeping a very close eye on as a foundation is that there are risks and opportunities. The opportunity is that there's this huge sort of proliferation of innovation taking place within the social enterprise space. So, you know, we hear about the demand side and the supply side. I hear social entrepreneurs saying there's no money. I hear investors saying there are no deals. But the fact is, in both of those worlds, there's a huge amount of innovation taking place. And I think we have a window for a few years to really exploit that and create this industry. Um, if we think about a new enterprise class, not just a new asset class, um, think about the companies that, that held the future in the 70s as opposed to the companies that were seen to be holding the future in the 80s and the 90s. I think the companies that hold the future in their hands now are the companies that are thinking about the triple bottom line, are the companies that either define themselves as a social enterprise or whether they define themselves or not are recognizably able to measure themselves against social, environmental and financial um, measures. But it's also a period of flux, you know, it's a period of transition. We don't quite know where things are going to go. There is a risk of fragmentation. There is a risk that anyone can self-define themselves as a, as a socially oriented business. Um, and, and that's risky because it could dilute the whole venture. Uh, there is a, there's a phrase in the environmental field called greenwashing. Uh, there's a risk of impact washing as well. That, uh, you know, again, and that's why this ecosystem is so incredibly important. But I do think, you know, we are here because we want to seize this moment and we want to be part of trying to support the development of this industry. You know, the rain talked about you have to be, what is it, crazy, optimistic, and have money. 
Um, and, uh, and I agree with that. I think also within the investor world, we have a lot of very smart people. We have a lot of people who control and can influence and direct money. But we also have a lot of people there who do want to make the world, you know, it sounds cheesy, but do want to make the world a better place. And when you get those three things together, from our perspective as a development-oriented foundation, that's a very exciting prospect. So that's why we are so excited about investing in social capital markets. Thank you. Thank you, Ashton. Now, Paul, I know you have a brief presentation. Um, I know you advise a fifth investor on, you advise impact investors on investing in social enterprises in Asia. And I'd like to hear, hopefully, the rest of the presentation. Some of the motivations that you see in those investors, what they're thinking, some of the trends you're seeing in that uh, space. Sure, delighted to. And if you don't mind, I'll use the slides here. Great. Okay. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, really excited that you're all passionate about creating capital markets for impact, and that uh, Doreen and Robert are uh, putting in place the infrastructure here uh, that you will be able to list your companies on uh, or your financial instruments on in the future. Um, so I'm going to talk to you just for, I'm going to share a few things about basically how capital markets are broken. Yes, capital markets are broken. Uh, in finance, there's a concept of efficient capital markets, and uh, we can, we're experiencing over the past few years how they're quite inefficient. So I'll uh, just do a pop quiz. Uh, who here in the audience, raise your hand, if you've ever heard a CEO say uh, what their most important asset is? Okay, and what do they usually say? Our most important asset is? People. People, okay. Where are people on the financial statements? Anybody? There are costs on the income statement. There are liability on the balance sheet. But there is no line item for people as an asset on the balance sheet. And this is part of the breakdown in our capital markets today. And so uh, some very innovative people are actually uh, putting people on the balance sheet. So Infosys, uh, a company in India, a global technology company based in India, has a version of its balance sheet in its 2009 and report, which you can go to infosys.com and look that up, and find people as an asset on the balance sheet. That's the type of transformation that we're going to need to accomplish collectively uh, in setting up new platforms with metrics uh, beyond financial metrics, but that create financial value. So that's the genesis of HIP, which is really, uh, HIP stands for Human Impact and Profit. Hopefully it also stands for Cool Ties. And, uh, and looking hip when you're not in a suit. Uh, and so we were so passionate about spreading this concept of sustainable investing, impact investing, that we put nearly all of our secrets in this book called The Hip Investor, uh, which you can find on Amazon and uh, more importantly on Better World Books. Um, so go check out Better World Books. And, um, and we're fortunate enough when we wrote the book on uh, how to generate impact and profit, uh, that it made the business bestseller list. Over the past year, it's been embedded in six university curricula, including Thomas Ott Business School here. Uh, we're uh, going to uh, teach about 50 uh, IMBAs uh, about social entrepreneurship uh, in the coming weeks. And uh, it's also in uh, more than 50 global libraries in seven countries. So this is a how-to guide. There, to, uh, before this book, there was not a how-to guide on how to do this as a company, as an executive, and as an investor. All right, so what does that uh, mean? First of all, I'm a registered investment advisor in the US, in the states of California, Illinois, and Washington. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Check with your tax advisor. All right, now my compliance people are happy. Okay, so what is HIP? HIP is doing good and making money at the same time. And the reason why, over the past 800 years, we've had little traction on doing this, is that the belief has been you have to do one or the other, but you can't do both. And so there's no technical reason why we can't do this today. Sure, the capital markets are broken. The generally accepted accounting principles are incomplete. So the only thing uh, blocking us from moving forward is our mindset. It's not technical expertise. It's our own mindset. So working together uh, to create the impact investing market is what we need to do. And so what we've done is create a uh, framework, a measurement framework, around Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, called health, wealth, 
earth equality and trust and actually documented the metrics that companies have internally like employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, as well as other metrics like greenhouse gas emissions and staff diversity. And we mentioned that there wasn't gender diversity on this panel, but there is tremendous gender diversity in the audience. Um, and so again, what happens is when you track these metrics, you can actually map them to the financial statements. And so what we've what discovered is that companies that both disclose and improve their health, wealth, earth equality, trust performance end up as a portfolio outperforming the general market. So we talked about the size. This is a different version of some of the numbers that uh, Robert showed you to show that socially responsible investing um, is growing in Europe uh, and the US. There's not an official number for Asia. That US number is now up to three um, uh, trillion dollars, but that's still only one out of eight dollars uh, of assets under management that are invested for some type of social responsibility. That means that there's seven out of eight dollars where it's not the stated goal. Again, this is how capital markets are broken today. So from a, sorry about the formatting here, we had a conversion issue, but there are many types of investors, sovereign wealth investors, pension funds, retirement funds. Companies are even using their corporate treasury to invest for impact. So Starbucks, or Starbucks, uh, here, is, uh, uses its corporate treasury to invest in root capital, which creates fair trade uh, market for fair trade uh, coffee. Uh, inside Starbucks. So really forward-looking, we mentioned Infosys, focused on employees. Starbucks is focused on its supply chain. But the real innovators here are the individuals and uh, smaller family foundations who are really asking three questions. One, how much impact is my portfolio generating today? Um, and we have something called the HIP scorecard where we can do that. I'll show you an example. Um, two is, what impact investments fit me and my needs. And so what investors are saying today are, I have a risk profile, I have a desired return, I have some liquidity and income generation needs, and the leading investors are now adding impact alongside risk and return in their investment policy statements. So if you have an investment advisor, go ask them to put that in your investment policy statement and see what they say. And the, many are gonna look a little bit shocked um, and then you can hand them the hit book and say, here, read this and go do it. All right, so then the third one is to actually go out and allocate your portfolio uh, to do that. So this is an example um, for a family, uh, an entrepreneurial family who uh, happened to be very successful in agriculture, um, and they wanted to know what is the impact that their portfolio is generating. So as you can see, across all asset classes, uh, from municipal bonds to private equity to mutual funds to hedge funds, there's a range of impact, and you could rate this in your portfolio, and that's part of what uh, the Impact Investment Exchange um, for Asia can help do as well, is to raise awareness of what's generating impact, as well as financial return. Uh, and so when the family saw this, they said, oh, well, maybe we want to have more municipal bonds, which are tax advantaged in the US, because they pay for schools, and hospitals, and public infrastructure, whereas hedge funds, you actually don't know what they're invested in, and in many cases, the worst hedge funds are turning over your portfolio to try and exploit small financial arbitrage. All right, so then one of the things we've done is where investments, impact investments, don't exist is we actually build them. So we have something called the HIP Index. Uh, we started the HIP 100 in the US to reweight companies, not by market cap, but by sustainability metrics. Um, and here's one for Singapore that we're on the verge of launching. Um, and these are the top 10 companies in Singapore by their impact. Now these companies aren't perfect, but they are better than others. And so what you see here is on a score, the HIP score is a legend of zero to 100, is the top score is 42, and the bottom score of the top 10 is 20. In the US where we do this, the top score is in the 60s, um, and the bottom is in the 50s. So it differs by country based upon transparency and the type of sustainability performance. All right, so the, and this comes from the work that Rockefeller has done and um, uh, the Global Impact Investing Network. And so this is across all asset classes. These are examples of potential investment choices for a portfolio. There's millions and in some cases billions of dollars like Generation Investment Management, which is Al Gore, the former US Vice President, and David Blood, the former head of Goldman Sachs Asset Management, 
Yes, Goldman Sachs had, even has an impact investing group. Now you should ask people who work at Goldman Sachs about it, because they typically don't know about it. But it's there, and it provides positive financial performance to date. So what we do at HIP, uh, just to wrap this up, is uh, we help investors rate their portfolio. We provide a score, HIP's work harder, a HIP check, we call it, for uh, private ventures. Uh, we build investment indexes that don't yet exist, that focus on impact. Not the old negatively screened, but really positive criteria. And then third is we help investors either manage their wealth or we advise their advisors. Um, so that's a quick wrap up on what we're up to and happy to dig in deeper about how capital markets can be fixed. Okay. Th thank you, Paul. Now, I have a few questions for the panel, but I know we only have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to throw it out to the audience for either questions for the panel or statements about how you think you can be involved in this uh, movement sector. So take take a couple of questions from the audience if there are any. Please. Thank you. 
they should be disclosing that is useful for these types of decisions, maybe from your work, also for the more mainstream market. Um, so in terms of what companies can be communicating, uh, we should really look to India. There's a tremendous amount of transparency in the financial reporting, not only of Infosys, uh, companies like Satyam, Tata, starting with this. It's not only putting people on the balance sheet, it's tracking uh, greenhouse gas emissions. There's more than a thousand companies worldwide participating in the carbon disclosure project. Some of those companies report to the Carbon Disclosure Project, which is a nonprofit working with uh, several banks controlling uh, trillions of dollars, uh, that you won't find in their own report. So there are multiple sources. So one of the answers to your question is there are multiple sources. Some of those come from companies, some come to, uh, from government information like the Environment Department about uh, oil spills and things like that, or safety performance. Uh, some come from uh, academic institutions, so the University of Michigan now uh, working with uh, institutions like Singapore Management University are doing customer satisfaction. So typically you don't read about customer satisfaction in quantitative terms. Um, and so that obviously drives upline revenue uh, and market share. Uh, and then nonprofits uh, will do this, including in the US lobbying, corporate lobbying is reported. So you can actually create quite a rich picture of what companies are doing. So the ones that embrace that, that are being more transparent, uh, have been shown to generate higher revenue growth. So companies that are embracing, say, social media, like Twitter and Facebook, describing their strategies, uh, being open with the public, are and the big brands, uh, which include, say, Starbucks, are growing double-digit rates. And the ones who are opaque and holding back information are actually losing market share. So there's uh, so the encouragement for companies and the challenge here is 20th century business was based on controlling information, and 21st century successes are going to be based on open source and transparent information. And that means that your competitive advantage will have to be your speed of innovation or some other type of uh, intellectual property, not controlling information or necessarily resources. So those are some examples today. Another um, uh, indicator is uh, what does the board look at and keep management accountable for? So General Electric keeps all of its business unit managers accountable for greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And so if you hit your financial targets, but you don't hit your uh, GHG target, you won't hit your full bonus. So that's the type of uh, um, structure that companies like Alcoa interface are doing it. Being open about the metrics, uh, uh, putting it in their financial reports, and then having accountability and team for it. And I think the, the focus on disclosure is very important because investors may want to support social causes or companies that are operating in socially responsible ways, but unless there's disclosure, there's no way for investors to measure who's doing a better job than others. And so as we're creating impact investment exchange, one of our focus areas is making, uh, mandating a very detailed disclosure on the social and environmental uh, aspects of the so of what the social enterprises are accomplishing. Uh, we think that's the only way that investors will be able to distinguish good investment opportunities from bad if they really care about supporting uh, social causes. Now, I, I think we're out of time, and so I'm going to turn, thank my panelists, thank you Robert, thank you Ashton, thank you Paul, for a very informative discussion, and turn it back over to Doreen to take us into our next session.
something she's in our lungs. 